we're talking about literacy, uh, the future of literacy. And uh, yeah, please just maybe, because you've done this research about, um, well, as I understand it, uh, human relationships with AI and how they responded emotionally. And just a little briefly to know anything that you know about that, um, if we can learn, mm -hmm. and then we can go into talking about uh, literacy overall uh, yeah. in the future with AI. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that, it, first of all, it all boils down to human relationships. Humans, they they have always manifested this need to um, to relate to someone else, whether this is a human, whether this is a pet, or, or whether this is a bot. There is this need to sort of like share exchange information on a communication level, right? And and so I think it it is it, it all relates to this. Now, um, it all started when I started noticing how young children were responding to, for example, communicating with bots such as Siri or Alexa. There was a period when um when um Siri and Alexa were just you know coming up on the market and they were all, all quite new, and as bots they could respond you know, in, a, in as natural way as. Um, could be seen, uh, you know, five years ago, six years ago, and um, and 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 basically, the children were responding in a way as treating Siri or Alexa as though um, it had feelings, as though that bot could really understand what they were saying. They were also having these kinds of games where they would, <coughs> apologies, where they would be purposely quite rude with Siri or Alexa just to see how Siri or Alexa would respond. And it got me thinking, and it got me thinking why. And then I started noticing that it was not just the young children who were reacting in this way, but you could also see adults and how adults were responding to what was essentially just a bot. Um, we could also see this emerge even when it came to virtual worlds and you would have objects inside the virtual worlds. People were actually relating to those objects, were relating to non-personal <clears throat> uh, characters, to NPCs. And once again, I started observing, for example, gameplay, how people... Um, react to what's happening inside the digital game how frustrated the the levels of emotions they get so you would see anger you would see frustration you know and m most often okay they wouldn't be playing against other players though of course this manifests you know itself the the, the range of emotions sort of manifests itself much more when there's the teamwork you no know? when there is when uh, there are all these players playing together inside the virtual world but you see all these elements together had one thing in common how a human was interacting with what what, what was essentially non-human and there were still these manifestations of these raw emotions, okay? These this kind of visceral emotions um, that that could could still um, come out, could still be observed, and and it's kind of interesting. So there were projects and even research work um, that sort of started to um, try and understand how such how such virtuality or virtual representations or virtual objects in whatever form, whether they're just, you know, a, a voice like Siri or whether they could be seen in terms of, you know, avatars or inside games and how these could bring out certain emotions and manifestations in humans, whether such, um, whether such virtual entities could help, for example, support empathy in humans, whether they could increase the level of empathy in humans. And there have been many, many experiments to this extent. Now, um, the thing is this, um, when it comes to um, us relating to these, to these, um, to these objects, these um, entities, to, the, to this artificially generated um, being okay let's i wouldn't even call it being artificially generated synthetic entity yeah synthetic entity whatever um so so um the way we relate the way we communicate is as though we are sometimes communicating with other human beings and this is this is this is very important because we're 
still very new at this. As human beings, if you observe the majority of people interacting online, we're still quite new at discerning between the, 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 the human to human interaction and the human to computer to machine to AI interaction. And this is where I believe AI literacy should come. And I think that's where the most fundamental importance is. Mm. At the moment, you know, everybody's talking about AI, as we've been saying, even last time, everybody is talking about AI. People don't really know what AI means. But most importantly, people still don't know how to relate to AI. Mm -hmm. um, people still don't know how to react to an AI. And now we're living in an era where very possibly in the next what, three to five years, we're going to see more presence of AI, let's say in customer care relations, let's say in hospital management systems. So now we have to ask the question, if at this moment, okay, the way we're seeing people react to AI, okay, is like they're reacting to another human, what will happen when we have more increased presence of AI? How will these people react? How will these humans react to the AI who is now their customer representative, who is now their hospital um, manager, who manages their patient records or who manages their medicine? Um, well, I'm saying who, but it's which that manage um, their their basically their well being, and we might see um, more AI present in in various aspects of society. Okay, um, so how will the the person who may may not be as um, let's say as conversant with the technology world, though, though I, I really wouldn't make a distinct a distinction at this point in time because you know um some time ago like two decades ago we used to make a distinction between those that were developers okay we called them programmers the people who knew technology and those who weren't and i i don't make a distinction anymore now because the way um technology is being presented to us and the way even ai has infiltrated has permeated into our lives you don't have to be a, a you know, a developer, a programmer, a, a full technologist to interact and interact with AI in a in a good manner. You don't know you don't have to know the code, but you have to know, know certain essential things. Like for example, um, what sort of data you would reveal about yourself, what sort of um, information are you willing to give, how you respond, in which manner you respond, how you prompt the AI. You know, it's very important. Um, we do some studies in prompting AI um, because it's 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 a science in itself. And we do think we do these science these studies, for example, for prompting um, the AI, which is related to art or um, to to text as well. But in reality, we are going to interact with a broader um, use of AI. So I'm not sure I deviated, Adam. So um, maybe, you know, you can get me on track with something because I've said so many things. But I think the most common aspect is the fundamental and basic understanding, literacy, let's call it literacy, of anything that has to do with AI. Um, we spoke before this and we said, OK, first there was the literacy in, as in writing, speaking, then two decades ago, we started seeing uh, the emergence of this word digital literacy. You now, and everybody was talking about being digitally literate and whoever was not digitally literate then would contribute to create this digital divide. But now I think we've surpassed the digital literacy and now we need to move one step ahead and speak about mm. AI literacy. Absolutely. And I mean, the same happens to me, so don't worry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think what what uh, we appreciate, what people appreciate as well, is that we actually go on tangents and and, and uh, feel like we can say uh, whatever comes to mind. There's lots there, and um, so to start with what literacy actually is. You know, if we look at if we look at uh, at etymology, it's uh, to to um, 
like to to how do you say to uh, sculpt to to um it it came from the being a scribe right so you're being a scribe so you you use uh, clay tablets to uh, produce the writing in the some ancient you know pre alphabetic uh, some ideographic um, literacy as it was available from lettere so, which is also part of the latin and 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 italian um then translation of letters mm -hmm. no of 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 so this is um sort of the, it is there is a connotation with knowing with understanding but also communicating this understanding so this is you know, the fundamental mm -hmm. aspect of literacy uh huh exactly and i think what's very important like because the question is now, we have to redefine what literacy means in context of a new technological epoch, as it were. Because the read, reading and writing epoch has been until now, and it's very difficult for, I think, for most of people to realize that we are in a very historic paradigm shift. Um, very, very significant. You know, this is like 2,000 years of one uh, neurotechnology for as, as alphabetic literacy in re reading and writing. And then let's say just the 20th century, we started having, you know, radio, telegraph, um, you know, television, and then with that advertising and all of that, I'm actually, the work I'm doing right now is, well, is uh, how, because virtualization is just the ultimate, ultimate stage of that, which is what we're having now with AI, but really decontextualization of the medium from the source um, makes it so that the message and the communication can be manipulated. It's, it's the optionality of manipulating information and symbols is increasing, right? And now we have um, on these online environments, it's, it's very little effort and a lot, of, a lot of scale because it's exponentially being uh, transmitted and it's creates this um, these these online cults and and ideology and all of that kind of confusion and and breakdown of, of discourse. Um, so so like you said, um, there was the digital literacy again. There's another aspect. Digital literacy. It was still like we have the tools and we need to learn how to use the tools because we are a computer. And now we need to be able to how to use a computer. But now, what I would pose. Uh, the, um, AI literacy, um, what's at the heart of AI literacy, uh, it's actually not how to use it, but more importantly, obviously also how to use it, but more importantly, how not to get used by it, because that's the, where the intimacy becomes the new weapon, like curation AI in um, social media was curating the content, what we can and cannot see. So then it put us in boxes of people, everyone thinks the same, and it completely creates this illusion that you know, you know the whole uh, the, the range, the whole range of discourse, but in in reality you just see a very slim um aspect of reality, which is also distorted by all those opinions backing each other and, and being in these bubbles and echo chambers, right? So that was the problem when, which got us into where we are now after 10 years of social media, we are polarized, um, you know, mental illness, uh, cri identity crisis and all of that. And at this stage, we have, the game has completely leveled up into AI creation, AI, as Tristan Harris calls it. So now we have, with all this mess, which isn't cleaned up, we're just speeding up and raising it to a new to a new power basically where ai is becoming increasingly like you said these human and AI, human ai relationships we anthropomorphize the machine because the machine is designed to simulate us so it can instrumentally become better and better us until a point it's like larger than life right it's it's just amazingly faking it but we have evolved to respond to that, to build communities in this way and build, you know, civilizations and trust and all of those evolutionary mechanisms are hooked to our responses in this way. And now these responses are being instrumentalized because AI only has, for me, the big deal is like the big axis, which is the, what I try to kind of build my discernment around is the instrumental rationality and kind of, I would say, 
existential or intrinsic rationality. So there's a kind of rationality that we just do something for the sake of itself. Like, you know, we gather together, uh, I don't know, uh, people can go to a church or they can go, um, you know, um, intrinsic motivation for something. Like when we teach, we want people to be interested rather than get a good grade. That's ideal, ideal situation, right? So an AI doesn't have it. AI, as by definition, is an, it's algorithm driven and algorithm has to have an instrumental goal. We also know in order for this instrumental goal to be human well-being or human, human you know, um, align, to align with human ends, that's extreme, much more difficult and non -profit. it's just it's just very so obviously all those companies which are competing it will be the last thing they want to try because the money is elsewhere and now we have these so the, we have these machines which are increasingly effective at emulating human qualities humans anthropomorphize them because i also have clients and they report to me about the use of GPT and they say, oh, and he said, and she, and he said, and he said, and I'm like, and I'm like, and I'm there like, it's, it's not, it, you know, <laughs> but you know, but it's like me being, like you have this kind of, this sort of awareness is almost like abnormal. It's abnormal because yeah. the normal response is the response that will get you into the trap of, yeah make treating it as a person now uh, that is one aspect and um when it comes to literacy we have to also understand other aspects so let me give you an example um okay imagine a, 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 um, a, an activity where you are trying to decide which um which thing um, can be considered as food like edible okay so people can eat it or not or rather you can eat it or not and so you start picking up stuff and you know it's paper or, or plastic or, or or a mobile phone or whatever okay and you say okay this is not edible these are clear you can't answer okay you can't eat your mobile phone can you but then there are other things other gray areas um, such as if you're a vegetarian can you really eat chicken but chicken is food, right? So can't, why can't you eat that? And if you're vegan, then, you know, um, are you going to eat, you know, um, a fish? <laughs> Which, of course, you cannot. And these are the sort of questions that people start asking, like, how will an AI take such decisions? If the AI is taking a decision that will affect my life, OK, um, on which grounds will it base that it's saying, OK, this is for your well-being? What if there's an AI? OK, so imagine this scenario. You're in hospital, you're a, you're a vegan and the AI has decided that, you know, it's best that you have chicken broth because you're in hospital. And the AI has decided that in terms of, you know, a patient's well-being and so on and so forth, you should have chicken broth. But you are vegan. And though you might have expressed the preference or, or, or you know, that you are vegan, um, the AI will still tell you, oh, but it's chicken broth. So in reality, how is the AI going to take decisions that might affect your well-being? Being, and that might affect your life in general um, and how are you going to trust those decisions and how are you going to react to those decisions what are your rights in accepting such decisions and I think these are all questions that need to rise as part of a literacy program the mm -hmm. ethical side of AI data by Biases, for example. So how do we know whether the data that the AI is working with is biased or not? There is that very famous story that happened a few years ago um, when uh, a big tech company um, put AI in charge of its recruitment. So AI was deciding which um, CVs um, it should take into consideration for a top managerial position at a big tech company. Now, it took its records, it took its data, it learned, okay, uh, not, not from some programmer or something, but it learned through historically all the jobs that were taken up within that company 
okay, um, for, for, you know, a, a series of years, ever since its inception, okay, and the sort of like based on that data, it, it so fit to say, okay, no women, all women who send their CVs will be scrapped because historically, okay, and very few women made it to top managerial posts. So historically, this is going to show that women are not good for top managerial posts at big tech companies, which is, of course, preposterous. If, if, if you know, if, if you think about it, you say, what on earth? OK, um, times change. Maybe, you know, 50 years ago, the role of the woman as a, as a managerial um, you know, or in a managerial post uh, would have been seen a bit different in, in different circumstances, contexts and cultures. But now now things are changed. So how is the AI deciding my future in this case as a woman who is applying for a managerial post at this top tech company and it's deciding that that is better for the company that scrapping my cv is better for the company so how is it deciding that and these are ethical issues that we don't even consider we don't even know so this was flagged up and eventually that um, ai ai was stopped from the recruitment process. And they noticed that the reason why the AI was failing was not because of its program or its algorithm, but because the data that it had been fed was biased. But nobody knew that it was biased. People started um, understanding that the data was biased only after, you know, so many, all the CVs of women were scrapped from those positions. So what do we want to do? Do we want to say, OK, let's roll out AI to the public. And then when we see all these wrong decisions, all these bad decisions taking place, then we realize that our data is not good data, you know. So what do we do about that? And people need to realize that when we are relying solely on this AI technology. We're not um, just, you know, relying on whether the technology works or not, whether it's fascinating or whether it works like magic or not, but we really need to understand why. Why is it taking the sort of decisions that it has taken? How are these going to affect me as a person? Okay, so how am I going to, 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 to do all that? Um, and what are, again, what are my rights? And um, what about democracy, okay? Um, how, how will that be affected in this AI-driven era? All these are part of literacy questions that we really need to ask. So we don't just, you know, it's not, it's, yes, we do need to know about how AI works and we do need to know about how machines learn and, you know, and how, how, how they, you know, how they uh, manifest um, their learning, their knowledge. But um, we also need to know how AI is going to affect us our lives as humans and our own interactions. So these are all part of literacy skills that we need to achieve. Absolutely. And I think this is a very good example. So you see, it can only do as good decisions as the quality of data it has mm -hmm. and yeah. the kind of data. So the data was irrelevant in the context again because it's out of context and the social element and the kind of transcontextual element of that to realize that you're in a historical time where for the majority of history uh women were disadvantaged let's say and now it's changing so so and it can only use the back mirror right because it's a similar thing, like what's happening in, in science itself now. It's like if you fund, if you have enough funds to fund certain areas, certain kinds of studies and ask certain questions, then you have lots of evidence and then you can market that. Oh, we have so much evidence. But then what about all that area that is not profitable, but perhaps very critical to be done? Like AI safety, for example, is like there's like 90 percent from off the top of my head is 90% of research goes into AI development and 10% into AI safety. So then does it mean that there's, there's more likelihood of AI success and optimism? No, it does mean that if you paid enough equal amount of money to both parts of research, of which one is very profitable and the other one isn't, because if you worry about the risk, then yeah. you will likely go slower than your competition you and they will by the contract right so yeah. so people need to understand i think 
the, the literacy in terms of AI, it's just literacy of being a, an aware human being, basically, even in a broader sense, that people people just, you know, they follow the slogans and they say, trust the science, trust, it's like, you have to understand what the, the process of science, distinguish the process of science from the manifestation of that process in a particular cultural, historical, socio-political context. And all of that, like you said, the context of what data should be taken into account and what sort of even personal qualities may be implicit that are not even written in that CV. But there is this, what Nora Benson calls warm data, the data, the relatedness between facts or between yeah. pieces of data that we can imply because we understand the human world, we live in the human world, but the machine will just see the bloody data, won't it? It will just see the number, it will see the value, and it doesn't really reason in between that it doesn't doesn't you know conjecture or or, or wonder or, or, or it's doesn't not mindful. Infer. It doesn't infer. It doesn't so infer. I, yeah, truly. The, the, if I were to see, for example, taking the same example as I mentioned of the job CVs, okay, and I would see, and I would have all these files, okay, um, like dating back like fifty years or so for this company, I would, and I would be seeing the sort of CVs that were received and the people who got chosen. I would notice immediately this kind of pattern, you know, that there are no women, but I wouldn't just scrap the women. I would try to understand why. So then I would place a socio-cultural um, value to it. So I would say, oh, yeah, 50 years ago, the role of the woman in society in the West Western world was not as um, predominant as it is today, for example. OK, even though um, some would argue that yet we are, you know, we are still far off from from that kind of of, of role that that um, certain positions um, entail. But I would try to make an association with with what, you know, I know my previous experiences um, what I remember of the past, what I remember of the historical events that happened. And I would try to assign a meaning to that. At the moment, AI is not doing that. So AI, um, even when it comes to say, for example, facial recognition, no, we put in facial recognition systems to make our streets safer. But um, what happens when the AI does not really recognize a face or, or makes an error at recognizing a face and, you know, you're walking in the street and this has happened as well in, 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 in London, um, where there was a case when a young boy was misidentified by the AI as being a terrorist. So, you know, the police just rounded him up mm -hmm. and it's just a boy, you know, and what happens then? What, what, what do we no. do then? Um, and these are things that can happen. Whereas I would start by saying, okay, oh, look, there's this boy, he really looks like this picture. So, you know, I go there and I ask and I, and I think, and I see, I see a school uniform. Okay. Maybe this, this boy is coming from school and so on. And, you know, I try to construct meaning. Um, the AI will not try to construct meaning. The AI has the data, the AI interprets the data, the AI signals what it's meant to signal, and that's it. So the AI can learn, but it can only learn to manipulate the data, it can only learn to augment the data, or it can learn to predict from the data, it can learn to diagnose, it's fantastic. Um, and it can diagnose with a pretty, uh, you know, pr pretty good accuracy um, in some instances and that it can do a fantastic work. But what about, you know, the gray areas um, where it is, it is applied in different aspects of society? So on the one hand, we have to be critical that there are aspects of AI and the way it is applied that really are helpful and, and can be of great benefit to humans. But then the humans need to be very careful to retain the control, to understand how the AI has taken the decision that it has taken, and to also be critical of it. So it's not to make the mistake of trusting completely mm -hmm. the AI without verification, without being 100% certain that that decision is not going to affect anybody else in a in a in a bad way causing harm to people and i think that's what we need to avoid 
Right. So I think the main thing that um, comes up for me from what you said is that AI is not aware of its own ignorance, right? Which mm -hmm. is what because it that it doesn't it doesn't take account of unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. It yeah. sees the data and it acts on the data, which is what it's supposed to do. But uh, so, and this links interestingly, you know, to Dr. McGilchrist's uh, book, The Master and His Emissary, when he talks about right and left hemisphere. And his, his hypothesis is that over, um, over, you know, across history, we, there, were, there were different fluctuations of, you know, depending on our, you know, how we use our cognitive and linguistic skills. Um, of predominance of one hemisphere or the other. For example, in the Renaissance, when we had more like kind of all-rounded kind of, you know, art, religion, science, oh, culture, where all kind of more multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. right hemisphere, like very holistic, uh, mm -hmm. close to life, close to experience, uh, mm -hmm. interconnectedness, you know, um, not only manipulating, um, but also engaging with the real experience Felt lived experience of life, and the argument goes, which I have basically. <laughs> I always liked all those thinkers that had that implicit in them. I didn't know what connected them, but he connected all of those my favorite thinkers, like Nietzsche, Heidegger, William Blake, and Hegel. I think those, I, 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 you know, have been studying them for a long time, and he just put it together and 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 tied it up with the, like neuroscience the fresh neuroscience and cognitive science and like whoa it just makes so much sense and his his um view is which makes sense to me is that ai is like the left hemisphere uh, it, it's a it's it's a it's a simulation of left hemisphere basically because it's all it does is manipulating um so it all it only see parts it sees things out of context it manipulates and it cannot kind of because you can have these are two different the, the mutually exclusive operational systems as it were so you can't use the same language for poetry of the right hemisphere with metaphor and you know implicit understanding and this kind of you say um, associate things like dry data with sociocultural context and that's your right hemisphere trying to seek out this doesn't make sense is there another context yeah, that yeah, can add meaning, yeah. right? So I can actually make sense of it because for now it doesn't make sense. But AI just takes the data, picks it, and because it doesn't live in the world, in the embodied world, it it is a code, disembodied, decontextualized set of you know binary code with yeah. interfaced with uh, bits of the of stuff. So it's not it it's not a whole; it's a part, and it. And it can only assemble from data and synthesize a response, which is optimized for a particular goal, right? So it, in a way, it's a very left hemispheric, very kind of a limited, highly efficient, highly instrumental, but it cannot go beyond that instrumentality, it seems to me. Although I think... Bostrom is writing about this whole brain emulation thing, but I don't know the, the arguments. I'm I wouldn't really account for that, but there was thing like probably not with neural network models, and there's different models there that they suggest this would be more effective. But but I think um, just to kind of go back to you know if we can kind of um, uh, apply a metaphor of human cognition and then AI as as a, maybe an aspect of it. Um, for me, it does make sense that it's a, it's a very left hemispheric kind of operation because purely operational. There is nothing about uh, kind of being passionate about something or like the, the emotions, the, the, the doing things for the sake of them, doing them, right? Visceral, uh, the, visceral the, the primal sort of aspect of emotions, maybe, because it can recognize emotions and there is research uh, that's emerging of how to make um, possibly, okay, uh, uh, an AI, a machine, a bit more emotion, and mm -hmm. that it feels certain fear, or it fe it 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 feels um it feels well. We don't really know. Can't really say. But um, based on these um net neural network models that you're describing, based on the way the brain 
uh, is wired. Um, new and emerging res research is trying to, you know, its first attempt at this more generalized form of AI, we call it um, uh -huh. artificial general intelligence, um, AGI. Um, however, at this moment in time, what you're describing is the level that we're at when it comes to AI research and development. Uh, um, it's the AI that is targeted towards a specific job, a specific role. And this is where the danger lies when we associate human traits, anthropomorphize, as you say, this, this, um, this AI because the AI that we have at the moment is not yet ready for that. It's not, it's not nowhere close to that, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so we may get different kinds of responses. Um, on a kind of a dark note, um, there have been uh, reported instances where people who were, who had some mental, um, sorry, um, mental well-being issues, right? Um, so they were, they 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 had some some issues of 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 sadness of of depression for example and they were connecting with a bot um you know to overcome their sense of helplessness and, and isolation now um they were receiving some some messages from the bot and the bot them itself is designed not to um support um, certain um, tendencies that might cause harm to the individual. To having said that, um, the way conversations turn um, are still very mechanical. Uh -huh. There is a person who is trained, who is a psychologist or even a friend of that person, might try to go to the root of what is happening with that person who has the issues. Um, a bot will not. A bot will just try to respond in a manner as to try and change the mood, which is uh, very different. Uh, if you have, you know, some issues that go far deeper than just a mood swing. You know, we've all been through mood swings and you can have that friend who <clears throat> jokes and your mood is changed and maybe you can turn to a bot for that and, you know, the bot can play different kind of music for you and, you know, the mood changes. But when the issues run deeper and are more complex and relate to the human psyche, then certainly the AI is still far off the mark to offer the right kind of help. And this is where the, the, the problems arise, again, tying it into literacy. This is where literacy comes uh, as, as being quite vital because the human needs to be aware that that is a bot. It's not a human. It's not going to offer the same level of empathy a human might or the same level of understanding. Remember, I believe firmly that we are the product of evolution. So we have evolved and we carry in our uh, genetic code um, information that makes us who we are, that makes us the humans we are today. Um, now, a bot does not have that. A bot is still um, very, very new. Mm -hmm. So um, the way the bot reacts and responds to the world is all very new, whereas we respond to the world, to different cultures, to the different um, societal aspects of, around us um, very differently. So it seems that research is heading you know, innovative and novel research is heading towards identification. What would make a bot more human-like in terms of these emotional aspects? But so far, we're not. We're not there. We're not there yet. Yes. Um, yeah, and because of this very, I think for me, I'm not a Luddite, but I would say I'm a purist in the sense that we the aspect you mentioned of us being having evolved through certain you know even having the a number of generations before that is in our blood in our bones and in our dna and we have our own history so how can you then you can simulate that perhaps but you can't it can't be that it can, it can be a simulation of the thing but it can't be can't ever be the thing no. right so even if you have a bot that can fake a therapist and has, let's say, the sensibilities and whatnot is missing right now, then 
that relationship of that client will still be with a machine that is programmed to help it and not with a human being that cares about me. Because mm -hmm. there, you know, again, of course, there are some that who argue the opposite, just to be a bit of an of a devil's yeah. advocate here. But there are some people who say, oh, there are many people who don't have empathy. There are many people who cause problems and there are many people who cause, you know, all these issues to happen in the first place. And of course, there are there's there's good and bad in, in everything and everyone. The trick is to find the right people to help you. And at this right. moment you can have access to those people wherever area of help you need wherever field let's say medical let's say you know um, educational let's say anything re relating to work so there are people who can help you the trick is to find the right people and right. from the wrong mm -hmm. people when it comes to ai ai is what it is okay ai will take the decision based on the data it has there's not going to be the wrong or the right ai the problem is Will the decision it takes affect you positively or negatively? And if it affects you negatively, what can you do about it? Right. And I will take that point and actually flip it on its head. Uh, because, of course, there are people who lack empathy. We, that's the, la the, the more you lack empathy, the more psychopathic or sociopathic yeah. personality is. So, in fact, what, what uh, McGilchrist um, shows is that a psychopathy, you know, the more psychopathic one gets, that the more it's the lateralization of left hemisphere. So it's because it's it's it it doesn't read the 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 subtle cues. It doesn't really um, doesn't really read the implicit meaning and and all of that stuff. It's not really. It's very mechanical thinking. It's very instrumental thinking. You know, psychopaths like there's a goal and they do it and they there's no scruples. They will, you know, create a, a genocide, create a disaster. It doesn't matter. The goal is achieved. And and th that's why those people often become, you know, very powerful in society as well, because they have they don't hold back. So the end justifies the means. For the them. end justifies the means. Exactly. That's instrumentality in, in essence. Right. So then what what my thesis is in my own work is that as we engage with these machines more and more, they condition us into becoming more and more psychopathic. We see that, I mean, we see narciss narcissism is kind of, it's, it's a truism to say that we, ha we are becoming uh, narcissistic through the use of social media because we detach our own real, real lived experience Persona. from the from the picture we present to the world. And then if we're not careful, we, we try to live up to the image we present. And then we are also rewarded by the algorithms let's say some platforms better than others but let's say facebook and others you know the more outrage the more fear the more basically you you uh the more your your communication is traumatizing to someone somewhere the more you are being rewarded with attention and attention we are hardwired to want from our environment so then we become if we want to win the race social media race let's say if, if i'm 15 year old and um, 15 years old and I want to be popular at school I, I want to be popular on social media that means and if I'm incentivized to become more and more psychopathic in the sense I then become not only atomized from my fellow human beings because I'm my you know I'm, I'm more and more in my left hemisphere but then I'm also more and more matched for being deceived by AI once it becomes um, um, makes an effort to, uh, let's say, someone uses AI weapon, not even a therapist, but explicitly is, used yeah. as a weapon to 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 brainwash me and to uh, get into my intimate space and manipulate me into doing something, right? Because I'm already, I already think about the world as instrumental. I already see about things and people as objects and not really a being, beings w with whom I'm connected. So, so we are. This process, which is quite invisible, which is invisible because we're talking and majority of people don't don't even are not even aware, is moving us away from being human and towards being more integrated with AI of the of the like the dangers of AI, let's say. It's right? a very interesting question, you know, that we can ask here. And I do think that many people do ask it because the main trend is to make AI um, look and feel human but what if humans are looking more and more like the AI is that right is that some exactly well if we, 
And it's not just AI, but we have been arguably since the industrial era. And, you know, what happened to the ed education system? We have been put in these boxes and, you know, all the subjects were divided. So you can't see that, you know, the, 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 the transdisciplinary, you know, connections between subjects and everyone has to be the good worker and not a, a, an independent thinker. So we have already been kind of put into this mold of algorithmic thinking, and now it's just been put on steroid, on steroids with with the with the advent of AI. Which before that we could still have, we had more. We had it wasn't speeding like that. We still had a chance to explore, and life was slower, so we had the time. But now we either jump on the on on, on the you know we jump on a train or we being lost right without AI. So so it's this kind of predicament we're in, aren't we? And I think there is no real answer. We just need to keep on exploring and, and asking questions, which again, um, I don't think it's part of what being literate means. I don't think that being literate means knowing all the answers. Being literate uh -huh. means asking the right questions and keep on asking the right questions so that um, you try and seek answers as much as possible but doesn't mean that there will be right or wrong answers so i think in, in our quest to understand ai and understand how ai is going to impact our lives this is what we need to do we need to help people ask questions most often we see it even from educational systems uh, we tend to provide people with answers we expect people to come up with answers but sometimes the answer lies in the questions that we make, and we need to make those questions. Life is not just about answers, but we need to question why, we need to question how, we need to question what, what if, you know, uh, and all these things. You know, we start thinking, we slow down the process, as you're saying, it's too fast right now. We are not absorb. We, 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 we're not absorbing it fully. We we are just, you know, getting all this at us. And what we're trying to do is adapt as quickly as possible so that we don't miss the train. Right. And to adapt. Yes. And, and then just before we finish. So I absolutely agree. It's more about the attitude. So, again, this would be the, the transformation of the definition. Yeah, Redefining what literacy means. It's not about providing data, providing answers as much as. It is about having the right attitude, curious attitude, humble attitude about our own ignorance and um, the kind of a will to foster some kind of wise approach to knowledge. The knowledge itself, intelligence itself is not enough now. We really need to go beyond that and try to um, maximize on that, which is yet impossible or will never be possible for AI. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank uh, you. I had one thing to say, but yeah, I, I'm sure next time we can do that. So, sure. Till the next time, then. Till next time. <laughs>